Touring Stirling Castle, I often tell folk it's our most besieged castle, from wars of independence through to the Jacobites. I've debated with tour guides at Edinburgh who say that it must be the most besieged castle because the Lang siege during Scotland's Marian Civil War lasted so long. But today, I'm going to take you to a castle that may have been besieged even longer and you probably won't guess where it is. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you the story. The beach along here is a place that we would come as children. For working class folk from Perth, it was an exciting day out coming to Broughty Ferry. And as a bairn playing with a bucket of spade, I never for a moment thought that this was a key location of the perennial feuding between Scots and our southern neighbours. Now, I say feuding between Scots and our southern neighbours, in the tale that I'm about to tell, we find a Scottish owner of that castle who only too willingly surrendered it because he wanted a Scottish-English marriage and made a few quid along the way, incidentally. And the besiegers, who were against the idea of Scotland becoming subsumed into England, preferred to build a stronger link with continental European powers. So, completely different from today. So let me give you some context. In the late 1540s, two streams of histories have been flowing. Confluent rivers crashing into an estuary opening its storm-tossed seas. One stream was political, the other religious. Henry VIII had broken with the Church of Rome because, well, that Anne Boleyn's a right wee cracker, isn't she? The death of Scotland's James V left a baby girl sitting on Scotland's throne when she could barely fit a potty. Now, whether she wobbled on a throne or a potty, the point is that the country sat on a powder keg. Now, from Henry's point of view, imposing a marriage between this baby Scottish queen and his son was the perfect way to bring Scotland under his ambit. And the religious reformers in Scotland saw that partnership as a perfect way for their own break with Rome. I'm going to give you two sieges for the price of one here. You see, around the coast at St Andrews here in May 1546, a bunch of those religious reformers burst into the bishop's castle and murdered a cardinal. I'm not going to give you the whole story because I covered that in one of my favourite videos that not enough of you have watched. I'll leave a link at the end, so hang around and watch it. These cardinal murdering religious reformers then locked themselves into St Andrew's Castle. Clearly, they'd rebelled against their Scottish Queen, who was actually French. But they looked for support from England and the now Protestant Henry VIII. That's what started this siege. Shortly after the death of Henry VIII, on the 27th of February 1547, an English nobleman called Andrew Dudley was appointed Admiral of the English Fleet, with a role to oversee the annoyance of the Scots. One of the things that Dudley did was to strike a deal with the besieged cardinal killers slash religious liberators. Pick your side. I think Castilians the accepted term. They would get English aid to hold this castle against Scottish authorities. Indeed, they would surrender the castle to the English and help ensure the marriage of the wee Queen Mary to the new English boy king Edward VI and thus ensure the perpetual peace and unity between these two realms. But Dudley didn't stop there. He continued around the coast and struck another deal with a guy called Lord Grey, who owned Broughty Ferry Castle. He was also a pro-English Protestant with no time for the 
Catholic, Frenchies, or their cheese-munching Scottish pals for that matter. He would also encourage the marriage between baby Mary and young Edward. What he wanted in return was for the English to accept his land claims up the Tay Estuary in Perth. In fact, he reckoned he could even help deliver Perth into English hands. There are so many duplicitous characters, side swappers, mind changers, money grabbers and double agents in this story, it'd make your head spin. Like a record baby, right round, right round, right round, right round, right round, right round. The siege at St Andrews was broken with the help of French artillery and a naval blockade. Now, remember, if you want more, I've got a video coming up after this. Incidentally, I've got another thing that I'd love you to see. I'm heading down under in 2023. I'll be touring my live show in Scotland later in the year, but I'm going to start by taking my comedy show Stories of Scotland to the other side of the world. History with a laugh will be coming to Perth, Adelaide, Dunedin, Melbourne and Brisbane. So, for details, the dates, both home and away, click the link to my website in the comments below. Needless to say, the English reacted to the defeat of their allies in St Andrews and French influence in Scotland. In fact, to ensure that perpetual peace and unity between the two realms, they invaded. The most dramatic point of the invasion was the 10th of September and the slaughter at the Battle of Pinky Clue. This was the last pitched battle between Scotland and England. In case you're wondering, I've got a video on that one as well. You should watch it. Post Pinky Dudley, remember him, sailed up the Tay Estuary and took Broughty Ferry Castle here from Lord Grey. Unlike the French at St Andrews, not a shot was fired. Why would there be? They had a deal. Some records suggest that the English fired three random shots just to make it look like a competition. But there was no real resistance. Gray himself was paid a thousand pounds for his fishing rights. The keeper of the castle here got an English pension and the messenger who was the go-between of the castle and the English ships was given four pounds. When he saw the castle occupants, Dudley said, Never had a man had so weak a company of soldiers given to drinking, eating and slothfulness. Fortunately, Dundee folk are nothing like that today. Just because you haven't heard of this siege that followed, it doesn't mean that it wasn't important. Don't underestimate it. Broughty Ferry was a key strategic acquisition. These days, it's a middle-class commuter town with a beach and a train station, but back then, Dudley could see its huge strategic importance. They tell me that the currents down the estuary made it difficult for ships to carry out a naval bombardment. But if you hold this castle and the waters around about it, then you can control the Tay estuary. Dundee and Perth can be cut off from the sea. Anyone wanting to get in or out would face a choice, drown at sea or walk through Fife. It's a choice I hope I'll never have to make. A month after arriving to take the castle at Broughty Ferry, warships off Dundee persuaded the constable, the baileys and the town council that discretion was the better part of valour and they signed an agreement to surrender the town and resist the Scottish army when it came. Grey and Dudley would put a garrison of 20 men with cannon in the steeple of Dundee. A month later, the Scottish troops arrived, led by the Earl of Argyll. Although Regent Arran had already been round and laid siege for a short period before, but let's start the clock ticking and call this the start of the Broughty Ferry Siege. 
Argyll and his men were pushed back and the castle garrison with the help of an Italian engineer and English troop ships in the estuary then set about building stronger defences. Ships also sailed up the Tay to Perth. Now remember Lord Grey. He'd promised to deliver Perth as well. But there was another guy keen to deliver Perth. He was the son of the Perth Provost. His name was Patrick Ruthven. Aye, that's right, the Ruthvens. Now there was a family that was at the centre of 16th and 17th century Machiavellian power politics. When men burst into Mary Queen of Scots chamber to murder Rizzio, Ruthven was at the front. When Mary was forced to abdicate at Loch Leven Castle, it was Ruthven's son who held the pen. When James VI was abducted as a lad, it was the same son of Ruthven, and it was his sons who were at the centre of the Ruthven conspiracy that I'll cover in a great video called The Day the UK Nearly Didn't Happen. It's a belter! And another piece of homework for you to watch. In spite of several sallies up the Tay and Grey and Ruthven's machinations, Perth stood firm. The Fife Coast wasn't quite so lucky. Two ships crossed and burned Balmerino Abbey on Christmas Day. Into 1548, and the year started with Scottish troops trying to assault Brotty Ferry Castle here again, but to no avail. On the 12th of January, the castle got new supplies of arms and ammunition coming up from Berwick-upon-Tweed. On the 22nd of January, the English crossed over again to attack Fife. The Scots and the French allies took the opportunity to assault the castle, but it was a trap. The Fife house burnings were a decoy and the French and Scots besiegers came under heavy attack in that direction. When the English tried the same decoy trick three days later, their Fife landing party got quite a fright. When 600 men were waiting to ambush them, they don't like up them, Captain Manning! They don't like up them! They don't like up them! Captain Manning! They don't... On the 3rd of April 1548, the English Privy Council suggested a yearly pension for Lord Grey of between 600 and 1,000 crowns. By November 1548, when the siege had been going on for more than a year, Lord Grey was captured by French troops and brought to stand trial for treason. On the 18th of December, the French commander wanted him executed but the Scottish governor and regent said no. Now it turns out that Grey had made a compromise with Marie de Guise back in March, promising to serve her and Mary Queen of Scots and accepting a pension of 500 mercs. The dirty, slimy, sniveling, money-grasping, bitchy grabbing bastard! You fucking double-dealing bucket of shit, you! I'll stick it right up your f more than two years after it started, this was still going on. Obviously, there have been skirmishes that I haven't mentioned and plundering the Dundee and you get the idea. But more than two years. And then, Christmas Day, 1549, Marie de Guise and her advisers decided to bring up big French guns to besiege Brotty Castle. Twelve English ships arrived to support the defenders and it was the 6th of February 1550 before Marie de Guise arrived across in the Fife coast to watch the assault from the other side of the Tay. Six days of pounding and an assault that left the attacking French troops with 50 dead and 240 injured, but finally the garrison here surrendered. Brotty Ferry was once more safe for family days out and folk bringing their children along the beach in the train from Perth. Why not make that trip yourself? Walk along the beach, visit the castle, enjoy the Tay estuary and relive the momentous events of Scotland's rough wooing. But before you do, Please watch that video about St Andrews and the death of Cardinal Beaton. It's not like any other video that I've made, but it's coming up 
on screen now. And help us to keep making these videos by clicking the top right to become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, Hamian Dawkins can be a lamb alive. Cheerio and drastic.